Thank you for uh, asking me to, uh, to speak today. I am a Victor Stone Carver. I run a company called uh, Maniki Rock Art, and we do uh, all sorts of things, but mostly the thing I'm most obsessive about, which is early medieval uh, sculpture from, uh, from Pictland. Now, most of what I'm going to uh, talk about today is not in uh, Tayside, uh, Angus, or Fife. <laughs> it's actually destined to be in Rosshire, and that is the uh, Conan Bridge stone that was found in a, in a burial ground a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was asked to carve a, a replica of this um, as part of some flood prevention work uh, up in Conan Bridge. So it's going to be pretty near the, the entrance to the, to the village. It should be in the ground by now, and it isn't, but more, more of that later. So this is John Borland's uh, drawing of the Conan Bridge stone. So as you can see, we've got what we think is the top half, pretty much, um, of a pretty substantial monument. It's a Pictish cross slab. Um, from the drawings and from the early photographs, I formed uh, uh, the erroneous opinion that this wasn't a particularly sophisticated monument, but I, I, I swiftly changed my mind when I started trying to, to recreate it. So, you know, the question is, how, how do you go about recreating something like this? You could try and make it look exactly the same, but you are not going to learn an awful lot from that, in my view. In fact, you could scan it and 3D print it, and you'd probably come up with a much better result. Um, so what I chose to do, and uh, thankfully the people commissioning it agreed, was to carve it as new. In, otherwise, in other words, to recreate all the missing stuff, uh, and that then became uh, pretty much the ultimate commission uh, for me. Most of what I do is little stuff. So I started uh, my company in about 2010, went full time in 2014. I, was, uh, I did formally have a career in IT. And in 2014, I informed my wife to her delight that I was giving up a life of Mercedes Benz cars and, uh, and uh, international travel in order to become a stone carver. And thankfully, she's got a great sense of humor. She said, I'll give you six months. And uh, uh, and here we are. So uh, there are a couple of things I've been particularly proud of doing in my, in my life. One of those is, is carving the replica of uh, one of the Money Feath stones, which was commissioned by uh, Christina um, many moons ago now, uh, which is on display in my hometown museum, which gives me a, a huge amount of pride. Uh, in the middle, uh, we've got uh, Kirimur 1, uh, which I've carved a number of times, and we'll come back to Kirimur 1 when I talk about another little project later. And on the right, is one of the panels from uh, Sueno Stone, which I did for the uh, Forestry Scotland uh, as part of one of their uh, publications. So these, these are the kind of things that I tend to be working on. But what I really wanted to do when I started this was carve things to put out in the landscape, right? Things that will be there forever. It's a kind of immortality, right? Because I know that I'll measure the passing of my life by my visits to these, uh, to these stones. So on the left and the right, it was the first big piece of work I did, which was a nine foot uh, new cross for Fortiviat in Perthshire, which was commissioned by Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. Um, so it's a, it's a big bit of stone, very narrow, so lots of design constraints. But what I did for the very first time there was take uh, fragments that had been found at Fortiviat, which were then uh, be being prepared for display in the, in the church, um, and used those to inform the design and try and produce something coherent. Because the thing with picture sculpture is that sometimes it looks a little bit haphazard, right? It looks like it's been quite easily put together. Believe me, it isn't. It's the hardest thing in the world to carve within a tradition, but try and kick the can down the road a little bit and do something with it. So this is, this is new design, but trying to take some of the conventions of Pictish art and some of the fragmentary evidence from that site and, and, and extrapolate it into a design that works and has the right scale and all the rest of it. And it just showed me how difficult it was, but it was fantastic uh, practice for what was to come later. The, the one in the middle is a new stone that was uh, commissioned uh, by, by Arbroath uh, 2020. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it takes some of the, 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 the uh, evidence from things like the Drosten stone, but producing a new piece of, of uh, sculpture, which is um, at St. Vigian's. And the bottom, this was a lesson I learned. It says, to St. Vigian Aberbrothic, to St. Bride Pan Bride. And I often get asked, well, what's the source of that? Where did it come from? I just made it up, right? Um, it just looked right uh, and sounded quite right. But everyone thinks it's something uh, really ancient and... Uh, I should put a wee note at the bottom, I made this up, right? So uh, this is the kind of stuff that, uh, that we've been commissioned in the last year or two to produce. These are two stones that I did for Brechin as part of our Brechin tourism project. Um, the one on the left, um, I, I designed as a, a very rich, almost sort of carpet page um, sort of experience. And I did all sorts of things like 
interpolation of, 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 of motifs and, and uh, doing that transmutation thing that uh, Cynthia Thickpenny is always telling me about, um, where I go from uh, key pattern into interlace and back out again, and trying to, to get a looseness to it. Yeah, there are no, no grids drawn for any of this, all of the interlace. In fact, I, I carved most of it just slightly ahead of my apprentice Tristan, who's at the back of the hall here. Uh, Tristan is one of the most competitive per people I've ever met. So we carved this one here. Uh, I'd set aside two months for this, but uh, Tristan was working on one side and I was working on the other and I was drawing ahead of uh, where we were carving. It was trying to give it a nice organic feel. Uh, and we did it in about 10 days. Yeah, because uh, Tristan was trying to keep up with me and I'm thinking, I'm not having that. <laughs> so we, we battered through it in 10 days, but it, it, it did, um, it did make me think an awful lot about investment and time in early medieval sculpture. And it led to me working with uh, University College Cork um, on a, a project to estimate uh, the amount of time invested in certain classes of monument. In fact, we're looking at the entire corpus of early medieval work in the whole of the island of Ireland um, and classifying it into um, investment units of time, broad ones, you know, like five to 10 days, 10 to 30 days, this kind of thing. And it's really fascinating to look at through uh, samples of each type of monument. The only one I'm not working on is the high crosses. I'm not going anywhere near those. They could have taken any time at all. I don't know. Um, so this is, uh, this is sort of the popcorn segment of, the, uh, of proceedings, because I should be able to launch a video there. Doug? Yeah. Well, that saved me waffling on for a bit, didn't it? So that's a, a, a stone that I designed as a, with, with a, a sort of incise program, class one stone in old money uh, program, but carved um, in relief, in quite high relief, and to be quite a stunning thing uh, by the, the, the burn in, uh, in Brechen. Uh, this is the next one. So this is a more complicated stone. Best fun I have ever had. Because I designed it on the fly, you know? We just uh, designed each bit and drew it onto the stone as we were going. It was just the best fun. I even hid some little mice in the interlace and things for kids to find. It was a lot of fun. But one of the really useful things that I did was um, measure sort of key pattern, interlace, a sort of uh, 10 centimeter panel at a time and timed how long it took to carve it, yeah? Which is really useful information. Because I think we think they took much longer to carve than they actually did. 
Yeah, I don't think the investment in time is, is, is all that massive. And I think we tend to look at things like the Meagle Assemblage or St. Vigians, and we think that there must have been a, a, a workshop turning lots and lots of stuff, this stuff out. But of course, we forget the length of time that, uh, that the sculpture was accumulated. And it makes me think about how much of it was relevant at any one time, you know, and how much of it might have been looked after or painted or even, right? Whatever's going on there. But I just don't think, you know, when you look at the period of time that some, somewhere like Meagle was active and the amount of sculpture that's there that there was this big workshop turning out a stone every week it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't make much sense to me so uh, back to Conan Bridge right so we've got a very very worn monument uh, not an awful lot to go on at times so this is the absolute best commission you could ever give someone like me because I've got to replicate some stuff I've got to look at pretty you know <laughs> Um, you know, precious little evidence really for some of the things like interlace, but it make, makes me think about how each different section, how deep it was carved, in, for example. And then I've also got to carve half of the stone in keeping with the rest of it and in keeping with the other monuments that we have in, in, in Pictland. So it, was, it kept me awake at night, uh, many a night. Uh, that, that last drawing in the middle was uh, John Borland's little sketch from getting started uh, with the two big symbols at the top, which obviously we see quite a lot of. This is the piece of stone. When the piece of stone arrives in the workshop, it's always a happy day, yeah? Um, and we always start at it with great gusto. So it's about 0.85, it's about a little bit more than that. St. B's sandstone, so it's a decent match uh, for Conan Bridge. Um, there are no quarries around Conan Bridge that I could use for stone, so um, we went for something that, that, that looks kind of right, but it's much finer in texture. So um, we've got this wonderful bit of stone that arrived. Uh, and I went at it for a week and started, did, you know, drawing all the things and big symbols. And then I found a fault that ran from the top of the stone all the way down to the bottom. And when you find a fault like that, you try and work around it. But on this occasion, the stone either side of the fault, um, water must have got into it. It was softer than the rest of the stone. So, yeah, but I had to swap it for another one, which always makes the quarry really happy uh, when you ask them to do that. Uh, so this is the next one coming in playing around with JCBs. This is my workshop on the right, uh, which, is, uh, which is my happy place. Um, so we started again. This is day one, would you believe? So, you know, we get on with it pretty quickly. This is the top section. And this is getting down to kind of the level of the stone where we've got evidence. There's something I can go and look at uh, and recreate. So this is, this is just fun, really. Yeah, and we start bringing it to life. So things like um, you know, the, the, the centaur here and this fantastic figure here with these big cauldron um, and then these, you know, fantastic beasts here with their snarly faces. Yeah, and we're just bringing it to life, but all the time looking back to the stone, looking at John's drawings, looking at the photogrammetry evidence uh, that we've got and piecing it together. In terms of the stones that I looked to, yeah, to in order to recreate the bits of this monument that I that I didn't have access to. Uh, I kept coming back to this stone here, which is um, up in Golsby. It's pretty clear that on one side, you know, we've got a, a typical Pictish narrative scene. We've got symbols, we've got centaurs, we've got a hint of a of cattle, yeah, um, and 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 therefore I'm looking at stones that have got a, a similar sort of program. And I came to the conclusion that a hunt scene would be pretty much right for the next bit yeah, coming down in the, the scale of the stone. But on the cross side, it was obvious that we had a cross, we had the two dragons or, or beasts at the top, and then we had what the Hendersons called this modular approach. So it's like a little panel of everything in the carver's repertoire. Yeah, in a, in a U shape uh, around it. And uh, Gospel is one of, one of my favorite stones. You get this fantastic, uh, key pattern at the bottom where the person designing it hasn't set out a grid, right? So they set out on this key pattern journey. And this is just what I did with Brechin, right? They set out on this journey and it's almost a challenge to yourself. Can I bring this back in at the point where I come to a corner? And with the Brechin stone, I did that with the interlace. I didn't draw into the corners. I just dealt with the corners when I got there, so the corners are all different. And I was trying to get that looseness that you see in Pictish art, where they understand the convention. It's almost like Les Dawson playing the piano badly, right? You need to know how to do it right in order to make it sound right when you do it wrong. So, yeah. So, they, it, I always come back to Goldsby, and Goldsby's got this fabulous thing where it just goes completely wonky and then brings it back in. It's almost like a dare, yeah? 
Fantastic. So um, I, I see this monument as being much more um, complex, much more sophisticated than I did to begin with. And all, all roads lead to NIG for me. Yeah. So it's almost like we start here at, at, at Logie Rate with the, you know, two big symbols, cattle and things going on underneath. Um, and then the cross, which is much, much simpler. Um, you know, it, it, it goes into this sort of modular approach, I think, because we, the evidence is there uh, when we get into it on the, on the cross side. The other stones that I took as inspiration were uh, Droston at the end, particularly with the narrowness of the stone and the way that that narrative scene is, is, is played out. The two uh, stones here are, are, are nig, so you can see what I'm talking about here. This modular approach going under yeah, the, 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 the shape in the middle, and it's almost like a little bit from... Um, the artist's repertoire <laughs> as, you, as you walk around. And then Shandwick with its, uh, its great narrative scene as well was, was, was inspiration for it. And others, including um, things like the stone at, at, at Bridgham. This is how it, it, it played out for me. So coming down the stone, we've got to about the horns of the cattle, yeah, to, to work with. Um, and I've, I've made this, uh, this, this hunt scene down below and tried to get the shape to flow. And this is the difficult bit. Uh, it looks easy. Uh, when it comes to designing pages stones, it's not. So trying to, to, to use little shape fillers like uh, the, the little fawn here to try and do that Pictish thing that you see particularly at me where they fill a space with something and it tends to be quite, uh, quite a sophisticated use of that space. So this is the stone really coming on. This is me working away on, on a key panel. So this is like a 10 centimeter square panel that I could then provide that information to, uh, to, to the chaps in, in Ireland to say that 10 centimeter square of interlace or key pattern takes me X amount of time in sandstone carved to that depth. And then I can give them variations based on, on different stone types. And if anyone wants any of that information for anything academic, then uh, feel free to ask. This is us moving the stone again. I'm not quite sure what my hand on the right is expecting to do, um, but it, it just uh, is illustrative of how nervous I am whenever we move a stone because you touch a wall or something with that. So I, I can just hear myself saying steady, <laughs> steady. And uh, you can see the, the, the pattern there. Again, that's something we measured uh, the amount of effort involved in doing that. And it begs the question, how do you turn a stone like this over? People often say to me, uh, they expect you to know how, how did they turn Sueno's stone over? How did they write it? I have no idea. No idea at all. I do it with two JCBs. <laughs> so <laughs> two JCBs and some pretty long straps. And we, we, we lift it and then we turn it like that. So you need good JCB drivers. It's not just up and down. You've got to do it in a circle. And the stone rolls within the straps. And we put it down back down on the pallet and move it back into the workshop. So um, how they did it. Yeah, in, in days of old, I have absolutely no idea, but uh, it's, it's fun thinking about it. So that's that side finished, and we had to move on to the next one. And uh, these are my first uh, drawings, and this is how we you know, move from drawing uh, uh, on paper straight on to drawing onto the stone, which is always great fun. And this is, you know, a bit of progress. Now, I highlighted this slide because... This is John Borland's drawing, which is better for me to go on than, uh, uh, than, than, than photos of the stone. You'll see in this area here, um, here, there's a sort of faint outline of, of three circles yeah, within that interlace. So this is my interpretation of that, and you can see the three, three circles. Now, th this is where someone like John Borland's fantastic, because John's trained to record what he sees, um, not to make it better. Yeah. And the temptation in doing this is, is always to make it better than it actually was. Now you can see from the original stone that sections like this have lasted pretty well. The, uh, the tongues of the, 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 the dragon beasts have lasted pretty well, but the interlaced panels have not. Therefore, I'm assuming that they were not carved particularly deep. I would love to have made that a lot punchier, um, but I'm trying to make it look like it looked when it came out of the workshop uh, back in the day. So I've carved it quite lightly yeah, on the original. And again, you can see in this panel here, I've just got this, uh, this little, little curly cue to go on. That's not an awful lot of evidence for that interlace. Um, so again, sleepless nights trying to work out how on earth that interlace panel could have looked. Yeah, and, uh, and this is what I came up with. So 
working just from that little curly cue in the, the top left hand corner of the left hand arm, I've extrapolated a whole interlace section. Yeah, and this is how we, we how I went about that, which was fantastic fun. Now, I think I missed a slide there. Yeah, so this is how uh, I'm working down. The, remember the the the, the uh, modular. Um, approach as the, the Hendersons have it, where you've got a little panel of everything. That panel took a lot of redesign, and I had some help from a, a friend of mine, Craig Lowe, in, in New Zealand. He helped me work out some of the zoomorphics of this, um, and John Borland helped me with that as well. Uh, this panel here is just really, really simple. It's like a weave, you know? Uh, so that was quite, quite straightforward. And then we're into new territory. So I've got to design something that looks kind of right, is in keeping with other stones in the area and elsewhere, stones with a similar program uh, of design, but I've got to come up with, uh, with something new. I mentioned that key pattern that went a bit wonky before. Well, this is me carving that key pattern. So from that drawing uh, and then carving the, the, the key pattern, uh, I then go into this uh, Golspie inspired freestyle section, yeah, which again is, 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 like a, is like a dare, right? So I've gone completely wonky, completely off piece, no drawing, just carving it. And then the difficult bit then is to pull it back into the next bit, yeah, and, 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 and change it, morph it back into something that is mathematics, which has never been my strong point. But you can see now, this is pretty much the finished stone. Um, it's still sitting in my workshop because Highland Council. Uh, have done two things. Well, they've done one thing and not done the other. They haven't put in the foundation yet. And they also built a gate <laughs> over the access into it. And the gate is 2.4 meters wide, which is exactly the width of the truck I need to get down uh, the track uh, uh, to, to install it. So it's still sitting in my washer, which is okay, because I quite like having it around, right? But this is, this is how it looks. So think about it in, uh, in two sections. Top section is replica. Uh, bottom section is reimagining, but trying to do it in the scale and informed by the other stones and, and the fragmentary evidence yeah, that, that, that we have for it. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty chuffed with it. <laughs> uh, I just can't wait to see it in the ground. So that's where we're at. Just one other little project I'll, 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 I'll tell you about. Um, I'm often asked, do you think the stones were painted, right? It's not, not an unusual uh, uh, question. And I, I've thought about doing something in terms of painting one of my, my stones before, but there was never really enough to go on uh, until I met uh, Jordan Patrick, who's doing our PhD at Durham um, on the uh, polychromy, the use of, of pigments, uh, particularly on, uh, on English stones from the early medieval. Uh, I also have a friend, Caroline Nicolai, who's an expert on ancient foods and pigments, and she's recently moved uh, from um, the, the deepest England yeah, up to Medvin. Uh, so I thought, well, if I can get these two together, maybe we can do something, yeah? So I set them a brief. I wanted to paint a stone in keeping with what Jordan's seeing in her studies. So, you know, particularly where she's seen use of pigments around interlace, so where on the stone the pigments are, what the pigments are, and then challenge Caroline to find those pigments within a 30 mile radius yeah, of Perthshire, right? I don't think anyone's really done that before. There's, they've done lots of variations of it, and there's things at Lindisfarne and stuff that are quite interesting. Uh, so I gave them this. So I carved uh, Kirimur 1, and what they came up with 
is that. My goodness, what a difference. Now, all of this has been carved. Almost all of that is ochre. So it's, it's earth pigments uh, from places like Creef and things like that. So the white is, is chalk that, that, that Caroline got from somewhere. Um, the black is charcoal from the burnt down crack. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did this at the Cranog Centre, by the way. Uh, and then all the reds, the yellows, uh, the dark browns, the light browns are just shades of ochre. Uh, and, and at times, at the event that we did this at, um, Caroline would, would, would disappear with a, thing, uh, with a little container of ochre and go and get her partner, who's a blacksmith, uh, to roast it in his forge to make it darker. So we're working with the same, same ochre, just in different pigments. And then come back and mix it with egg and, and things. And then uh, at the end, we put a, an egg white glaze on it. Now this is all learning, right? It turns out we made a mistake with the undercoat. So it's starting to fail now. So we're gonna power wash it and do it all again. But it's all learning because, you know, it, it, there is a suggestion that, that the egg white binder and the, um, uh, and the glaze need about three months to cure. Yeah. So I, 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 it begs the question of how often were things getting painted? But it, it was great to be able to use uh, Jordan's uh, research into where pigment was used. Things like the red outline around the interlace is something she's seeing at Lindisfarne. So um, I can't wait for her to look at all the Scottish stuff and the evidence uh, that we have at places like Port Mahomic uh, for using these pigments. But fantastic to work with. Two people just really on their game who are thinking a lot about this, doing some very, very good research and put it into action. And I'm sure it'll be, it just makes the whole thing pop, right? I mean, it looks fantastic. Uh, I've got it in my office and it looks, uh, looks great. So I'm really, really glad. Um, but it was just a fantastic project to, to be involved in. What's next for us? Well, we're just finishing off a replica of the Fiskevig stone uh, from Inganish on Sky. Uh, we're doing a, 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 a monument, uh, a memorial to women who were prosecuted as witches at Abernethy. Uh, which is quite an exciting one. And then we're on to Skinnet. So we're going to do a full size as new replica of the Skinnet stone uh, up in Caithness. And it's going out in the landscape as part of a pilgrim's trail. So people are going to approach this on foot. And I can't wait to see their experience of that because it's as close to original function, I think, as we're, we're ever going to get with the project. And then we're going to do Ulbster as well, out at the landscape as well. So we're very, very busy. But thanks for, thanks for listening.